right? Ready? All right, good morning, and thank you for your time. This session is uh, WPS 305, uh, how Fannie Mae uh, processes over a quarter million loads a day uh, using Amazon S3. My name is Harsha Nipani. I'm a senior solutions architect at AWS, and with me on stage is Oliver uh, Matthias. He's a senior architect at Fannie Mae and uh, who led the transformation journey uh, for a mission-critical app at Fannie. The agenda for this session, uh, there are three categories, uh, three segments of the presentation. The first uh, segment is I'm going to walk you through S3 best practices and uh, some of the performance tips in terms of architecting around uh, S3 as your primary storage layer. In the second uh, segment, Oliver will walk you through um, Fannie Mae's use case and the need to re-architect a mission-critical app and how that um, affected the business outcomes. And in the last segment, I will walk you through architecture best practices, especially in terms of resiliency um, and high-performance um, applications deployed on AWS. Let's get started. Uh, before we, this is a 300-level session. I'm assuming some of you already have background to AWS services. Uh, a quick overview about the AWS storage portfolio, uh, comprising of uh, block storage, file storage, and uh, object-based storage. We're going to be focusing on S3, the object store, uh, because that forms the crux of this uh, presentation um, with respect to um, the storage layer. Um, quick update on, um, it, it, we have a couple of, uh, two or three announcements on S3 uh, yesterday. I'm going to be covering some of that aspects as well, um, although I won't go dive deep into that yet because those are, some of those are in preview. S3 use cases, um, there is, S3 is commonly used for backup uh, and storage or for application hosting or for media hosting uh, and software delivery. Um, there are many mechanisms through which you can ingest data into the storage layers. And for large enterprise customers, one of the most common patterns that I have observed is through Direct Connect. Why Direct Connect? It gives you that resilient and uh, consistent network performance. Uh, that way, if you're implementing any um, hybrid architectures where you have a data center and then you have to push data from your data center to uh, S3, uh, you use the DX, uh, Direct Connect. And some of the, um, on, the, on the bottom slide, you can see the data transfer mechanisms. We're going to be touching a little bit in the resiliency portion. We'll be touching a little bit about Direct Connect and how do you architect uh, uh, your highly uh, resilient architectures on AWS, including uh, DX uh, integration with uh, on-prem uh, networking. S3 by the numbers. S3 was launched on Pi Day in uh, 2006. Um, it's, uh, a lot of uh, uh, development has taken place since then to improve the service, and it has seen tremendous growth uh, in terms of customer adoption and a lot of feedback that we have received from customers about everything ranging from security to performance, uh, just to give you a, a perspective about S3 as the main storage layer, S3 holds trillions of objects um, and regularly peaks at the millions of requests per second. And S3 is practically available in every AWS region in all the uh, uh, availability zones, right? And S3 has, uh, over time, uh, has been adopted by customers for a wide variety of reasons. The most important part is durability. It comes with 11 lines of durability and availability. Um, why is availability important in, with respect to S3? Because it stores your data in three AZs. So you don't have to do that um, natively yourself. Uh, it comes out of the box, and it's a serverless pattern. It's a lot of advantages of doing that, and also at internet scale. So in addition to the durability, availability, and scalability, um, the other things, um, the, the key promise from uh, S3 perspective is around security and elasticity. Uh, there is a huge ecosystem of integrators uh, um, with S3 offering you native integrations in terms of storage, in terms of disaster recovery, in terms of big data analytics, and also lately the machine learning integrations. I'll give you a little bit of flavor on that. So let's dive deep into S3 architecture. A lot of you folks are not familiar, maybe not familiar with the intricacies of how it's built and how we manage on the back end. Just to give you a perspective, as an end user, you will be um, 
you know, calling the S3 APIs for a wide variety of uh, actions like puts and gets and deletes. When you do that, it goes through our uh, S3 managed load balancers, and behind the load balancers are the actual API servers that are handling your requests coming in. And as, um, as those requests are uh, processed, the actual put operations are stored on the blob storage across three AZs. And then for all the objects that are stored, we have an internal metadata storage with which we actually track the objects where it's stored, et cetera. So um, when you issue a GET request, it's the metadata information that, is, uh, that actually gets processed and pull the data and uh, essentially give it back to you. Um, from a front-end perspective, S3 front-end manages 37 terabits per second at peak in a single region. That is, in a five-minute uh, peak in any given region in a, for S3, you're pushing through 1.3 terabytes or petabytes of data. That's right, 1.3 petabytes of data for a five-minute uh, average. So you can see S3 operates at a very high scale, and S3 is built for internet scale. Having said that, um, security. A lot of customers I have worked with, uh, the, for the, the number one question they ask is, what do I do to secure my data? We hear concerns about exposing uh, data uh, for misconfigured buckets, and uh, how do I make sure these, these don't become a problem? At AWS, security is job zero, and S3 comes with a comprehensive uh, security and compliance capabilities. We have already um, recently launched, I think earlier this month, we have launched uh, a new feature that gives you um, ability to prevent accidental data exposure caused by misconfigured S3 buckets. How did we do that? You can see, if you go to the Amazon S3 console, um, you can do the, uh, you can clearly see orange or, or public indicator for objects or buckets that are exposed to public. By default, when you create objects or buckets, you know it's, it's private unless you choose to expose that for public. And there is genuine reasons why you would want to do that if you're doing web hosting. Absolutely, that makes sense to expose some of the content to public. Um, in addition to S3 console and APIs to give you warning about public exposure, there is also a secondary method, a Trusted Advisor API calls. So you can use Trusted Advisor, which is a, a management tool. You can leverage that API to, uh, to look for any S3 bucket permissions issue. That is a second method for you to figure out uh, if there is any exposure. And then the public access restrictions, I think uh, that's also recently launched. Um, you can actually block um, public exposure by configuring that at the bucket level, right? And in addition to all this, you, all, uh, you also have integrations with CloudTrail, uh, so all your API actions are logged, and you can absolutely run uh, um, uh, filters and see if there is any specific actions that were taken that, that was not intentional. So in addition to security, a lot of customers also store sensitive data, uh, including PII data. And there are three mechanisms to encrypt data. One is uh, customer managed keys, SSCC. The second one is S3 managed keys, SSCS, uh, uh, the uh, server side uh, encryption using S3. And the third one, most popular that I have seen uh, working with enterprise customers, is SSC KMS. Why SSC KMS? You can control the master keys, and uh, SSC K the KMS service itself integrates very well with uh, many other AWS services, including uh, EBS uh, blocks. Uh, EBS storage or uh, uh, data store in RDS instances, et cetera. So that's a nice integration there. All right. Um, oh, before I move on, I just wanted to uh, call out there is also a, um, a compliance regime that we go through. A lot of customers uh, have asked if uh, the service is compliant with, say, FedRAMP, PCI, DSS, whatever the industry mandates that you have. Uh, these are absolutely um, uh, compliant for S3. And there is a compliance and scope page that you can look it up and uh, see all the compliance regimes uh, that we subscribe to. A lot of S3 customers uh, came up with uh, interesting use cases. Um, you may have heard about Netflix uh, using uh, bill billions of hours of content streaming from S3. Uh, there is also large enterprise customers like uh, Thomson Reuters or GE where S3 is used as a data lake, and that's a popular um, a pattern. Zillow uses a lot of uh, S3 content to do machine learning analytics on the property data. A wide variety of use cases. And then 
for customers who have invested in um, partner solutions on-prem, uh, we work very closely to, to ensure great customer experience. We partner with these popular enterprise vendors to natively integrate their services through to S3 uh, for, again, many use cases, backup and restore, primary storage, essentially extending that investments that customers have already made uh, in terms of partner integrations into S3. Now let's dive into a little bit more details. Um, a lot of questions about what are the limits of S3? How, can, how much data can I push? And is there a limit? So not, not so long ago, we used to advise customers that typically for put operations, it used to be 400, uh, sorry, for, for puts, it's 400 uh, requests per second, or for gets, it used to be 800 uh, requests per second. That used to be the threshold beyond which you may see hard uh, partitions, which means essentially you may get uh, uh, bottleneck dead IO operations. We changed that, we, uh, we improved the service, and earlier this year, uh, these are the new numbers, the 3,500 RPS for most of the puts and uh, posts and deletes, and 5,500 RPS for gets. It's extremely important uh, to, to understand these uh, numbers because if you ever go beyond, if your requirement, if your application requires more throughput than this, and if you want to push more, you can absolutely do that. For example, for the RPS uh, that says uh, 5,500 for gets, if you're, get, if you're doing more gets against S3 and you want to go beyond 5,500, the easiest method to do that is to manipulate the prefixes. So as it, because all these are contingent on a prefix in the bucket, right, in the path. So by manipulating, by adding, say, 10 more prefixes, you can exponentially grow your, your performance for each of these operations. What I mean by that is, if there are 5,500 uh, RPS for get operations a, for a prefix, if you add 10 prefixes, yeah. you're essentially driving uh, 55,000 RPS at that point uh, as an aggregate. Also, very important tip, a lot of enterprise customers uh, use encryption. Like I said, SSE KMS is a popular uh, mechanism to do that. When you are pushing the limits for S3 and you're manipulating prefixes and you're adding more, uh, pushing more uh, um, gets and puts, make sure you align those with the KMS limits. We have run into many situations where customers don't necessarily understand the nuances between the two. As you're increasing your requests against uh, S3 objects, obviously you are doing a decrypt and an encrypt uh, operation against the objects, right? Because you're KMS encrypted. So make sure they both are aligned. The KMS limits are published there. For These are the common, uh, again, why is that range? Because it depends on the region in which you're operating these KMS limits. Um, if you ever, again, this is a soft limit, we can, you can work with AWS support to make sure if you want to go beyond the 10,000 RPS for KMS, uh, you can work with us to uh, increase that. Although due to the recent uh, uh, S3 performance enhancements, most of the customers do not need to do this. We used to tell them you can do uh, three or four character hash or entropy as part of your naming scheme, as part of your key space. This is not needed. I just wanted to give you a, 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 a quick overview on why this is, uh, it used to be an important way of driving uh, more performance. But essentially, S3 stores data in a lexicographical format. So by, by doing that, what happens is if you try to push a lot of uh, puts or gets against a specific uh, key space, you used to run into a bottleneck at the key name space. That used to be a problem, it's not anymore because of the enhancements on the S3 side. But if you are really going way beyond what we offer today, or if you are going into hundreds and thousands of uh, RPS potentially, you may still want to consider this as an option um, in terms of introducing a randomness in your key space. That, and the idea is to do, you can parallelize your operations into these uh, key spaces and avoid uh, hard partitions. All right. Now, let's get into parallelizing. Um, as, as I told you, S3's, um, S3 service supports parallel operations, which means you can scale your S3 performance uh, by a factor of your compute cluster. What I mean by that is make your compute the bottleneck, make your network the bottleneck, and not the S3 APIs. So what you could do with that is you could use, for example, you could use range-based uh, get queries um, against, uh, to, to leverage multi-threaded performance 
In this example, the highlighted uh, range uh, 0 to 9, that's essentially fetching the first 10 bytes of an object. And you could do that into multi-part. You can align with multi-part and parallelize your get operations and with the different byte sizes so that you can actually get multiple uh, get requests for uh, large objects, right? Why is this important? This is important because you can add, this allows you to um, send multiple get requests to the S3 service, which means you're parallelizing gets, which means you're processing a lot more. As long as you have the compute capacity on the client side to process all this, you can absolutely do multi-threading architecture, get faster response, better throughput. All right. And also, uh, one uh, key takeaway in that uh, parallelizing gets is, if you are repeatedly querying for the same object, you may want to consider edge caching. How do you do edge caching? Through content distribution networks. And uh, the offering we have is CloudFront. Most of you may know that. What's the advantage of uh, CloudFront? Again, you're not only, uh, it's, it's a low latency um, way of uh, pushing objects at the edge and uh, to the end users. Now, uh, now that we have covered parallelizing get operations, let's talk about parallelizing put operations. So there are two types of network. If you are using a direct connect or something like that where you have a 10 gig pipe from uh, your data center to AWS, that's not a problem. You, you are pushing as much as your uh, routers can handle and essentially that uh, leveraging the, the 10 gig connection. But if you are, say, a, a user, a customer who is uh, going over VPN over the internet, it's a flaky network. You're, you're, it's not consistent network. So how do you ensure when you're, uh, when you're pushing large objects to S3 and you're having a flaky network, if, you're, if you get timeouts, you obviously essentially have to retransmit the whole thing, which is not a very optimal way to do put operations, right? So that's why we recommend doing parallelizing puts. This is multi-part upload for large objects. By doing that, the, the advantage is you are moving the, again, uh, increase the res resiliency of uh, network headers, and only thing that you have to do is to retransmit uh, the, the parts that did not make it, right? So that, that's a much more efficient way of doing it rather than the whole object. Again, so to, to summarize, uh, the key takeaway from a performance standpoint from S3 is a faster upload. Uh, we didn't cover this, but faster uploads over long distances, say for example, if, you are, if your primary use case is in Singapore, uh, but you're also um, the pushing data to US East One, you may want to consider leveraging S3 transfer acceleration. Why is that advantageous to you? Because you're essentially taking advantage of uh, Amazon's network backbone to push the data uh, natively using our network, and that way a faster um, copy of the data between buckets. Faster uploads uh, for large objects. Again, we spoke about S3 multi-part upload. That's the key takeaway for that. Parallelize your put and uh, get operations. Extremely important concept. Make sure you try that. Um, and also distribute uh, key space for high TPS. I, I told you about the entropy or the randomness in the key space. It's, it's, you can still do that, although it's not required for most of the use cases. You can absolutely do that. And TCP window scaling, it improves uh, network throughput performance uh, between your operating system on the client machine and S3 by supporting window size greater than 64 KB. So that's how you can take advantage of uh, better uh, network throughput performance. So how do you successfully modernize your, now that we covered the storage layer, let's get into the application uh, re-architecture and how that flows into the next segment. Um, how do you uh, successfully modernize your most uh, highly visible customer facing, maybe your tier one apps, um, and highly performant applications? And still you know, uh, be able to uh, talk about it, because a lot of uh, uh, process takes place in terms of re-architecting uh, applications at uh, scale. So I'm sure most of you in this room have, um, have been through um, or, or have dealt with legacy applications. And some of you have, uh, may have tried to uh, re-architect legacy applications. Um, when you are re-architecting, you have different patterns. You may have heard about lift and shift. You may have heard about refactoring. I'm not going to get into the nuances of what those are, but you know what I mean. Uh, essentially, uh, finding a pattern of um, developing uh, cloud-native applications, or in some cases, maybe due to the situation you are in, you may have to extend your data center capabilities, which means a hybrid solution. Um, so let's talk about um, loan processing at scale. 
um, this, this is uh, where you are uh, essentially taking advantage of the S3 layer and also taking advantage of the cloud native capabilities of S3 um, and also AWS. Just to give you uh, a recap of the things that we already discussed, uh, you have the linear scalability that is absolutely a requirement for uh, hybrid applications or cloud native applications. You need to have stellar durability, right? You don't want to be getting into the operational uh, management of how do I manage my storage, make sure it's available in every AZ, uh, all those things come into play. That's an operational overhead uh, that does not give you a business value, right? So that's, that's the reason I'm emphasizing this portion about durability and predictability in terms of leveraging a storage layer um, that's managed by AWS and at a reasonable cost. Now, the usual list, I already discussed uh, the, the most common use cases uh, for S3 from static web uh, hosting to data lake to social web uh, to image uh, and uh, to image processing and coding, right? But I have seen customers pushing the limits of what S3 can be used for. And uh, one key question that uh, came into, uh, again, a lot of customers have been asking is, can we use this as a transactional store? As a, as a backup and storage or, or analytics workload, it's great. It's already doing its job. But can I use this? Can I push S3 uh, to use it as a transactional store? Typically, transactional stores are, if you recall, most of these are either EBS volumes or maybe databases like uh, DynamoDB or RDS. Um, so a little bit of an unconventional thinking in terms of uh, the storage layer is, can we use S3 for high-frequency blocking requests? Can we use S3 for incredible, uh, very high, fast response, um, close to what you call a file system level performance? Can I do that? Uh, will we, what, would, what would it take to build a service that provides atomicity and consistency at the storage layer and still taking advantage about all the things that we just discussed about S3? So these are some of the things that we thought about. And, um, and, uh, it, and, and now if you go into the architecture of an application leveraging those capabilities and those requirements, the one way of doing it is you can absolutely build more data center capacity. You can, uh, um, you can uh, absolutely architect your application in the existing environment. The only problem is, again, there is a large uh, upfront capex, and you have to uh, architect for peak capacity, which means you have to analyze your 18 months or 24 months uh, uh, into the future requirement and then build your um, capacity uh, based on that targets. Or the Cloud 1.0 strategy is, okay, we can, I know what my IOPS on the storage layer is. I have uh, a SAN storage. The, the LUNs are uh, mapped to my, uh, my uh, whether VMware or bare metal servers. Now all I have to do is to lift and shift. How do I do that? Take my uh, provisioned IOPS, uh, whatever the IOPS I'm getting in the storage of SAN layer, I map it to e uh, EBS volumes and compare the IOPS and do that? Absolutely, a lot of customers have done that very successfully, no problems with that. The, the only problem there is, again, you have to consistently monitor your peak capacity, what, what your storage capacity is going to look like, and it's a slightly better strategy uh, than just continue to build out the data center capacity, but there are limitations to that one too. So what we started thinking about is, Let's get a little innovative. Uh, let's see how um, our customers can push S3 to the next level. And that's where I'd like to welcome uh, Oliver and to explain uh, Fannie Mae's use case and how they have in, uh, innovated and essentially uh, provided a resiliency to a mission critical application uh, for better business outcomes. I'm hoping you're clapping for him, not for me. That's okay. Um, so um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I will walk through Fannie Mae's use case, the initial um, solution we had in place, uh, and then uh, the complexity, you know, the challenges we faced, the components we added to the mix, how the solution kind of evolved to meet those needs. And then um, Harsha will get back into all the engineering that is required for a multi-site, multi-region uh, architecture. So I'm Oliver Matthias, um, and let's learn about Fannie Mae. So our vision is to be America's most valued housing partner, providing access to credit, 
liquidity, and affordability to all of US housing markets at all times. So we buy loans from lenders, pool them into mortgage-backed securities that are actively traded in the capital markets. This continuous flow of liquidity promotes a healthy housing market. How many of you have been through a loan application process or know of somebody who's been through a loan application process? Great, I see a lot of hands. I myself have been through it a couple of times. Did you know that one in three homes are financed by Fannie Mae? That's a great number. So let's get into that loan application process. Again, this is a very simplified view of that loan application process. There are a lot of details. But for the for purpose of this discussion, it's more around data, more around S3. So a prospective home buyer works with a loan officer, submits a loan op application along with a collection of documents. There's a lot of innovation happening in this space. A lot of integrations, a lot of automation, all with a goal to improve the borrower experience. This loan application, along with the collection of documents, are processed by Fannie Mae Systems. We validate them. We run a set of business rules. Everything around understanding the loan, understanding the borrower, understanding the underlying collateral. We then consume a lot of data, collect a lot of data from external sources, from internal sources. Again, the focus here is the amount of data we acquire, process, and generate. We then run even more business rules. And then return back to the customer with our results. So as we went down this path, this simple process had, uh, is a very important process. And we soon realized that we had three very important goals. Near zero downtime, near zero data loss, and milliseconds re response times. So the so systems already had a very high reputation, a very high quality of service that the customers had gotten used to expect. So what were some of our challenges? Obviously, we had to maximize on those three levers, availability, performance, and durability. We wanted 99 percentile of our transactions to be done in less than 300 milliseconds. We wanted linear response times, irrespective of the amount of data growth. And we had to work with the current system while we transformed the current system, so we couldn't lose sight of the target state. We also wanted to materially reduce our OPEX. We wanted to retire our systems on-premise and also use the agile cloud infrastructure you know, for its elasticity of compute, network, storage, on demand, and in a self-service manner. When you work on a large problem, it's typically made out of smaller parts. And all these parts and pieces and components have to work together to perform the larger function. We wanted predictability. And one way to get predictability is by having uniformity. We didn't want snowflakes. So early on, we set up some guardrails. So our design discussions became more easier once we knew this is where we want to go. So we wanted to reduce our chattiness between our on-premise service and our data centers. Obviously, as Harsha just mentioned, we had a 10 gig lines, you know, dual active active direct connects. We didn't want to have traffic going back and forth on those, on those circuits all the time. So we co-located our dependent services. We also favored localized executions as much as we could. We wanted our developers to focus more on building software and less on infrastructure control. We also wanted to build our new applications cloud native and use AWS native when the use case demanded it, case in point being S3. So let's get into the solution. So this is the typical work week in the uh, life of the application, right? Two key observations over here. We have an incredibly steep ramp. It repeats every day, an incredibly steep ramp. The other observation, at its peak during the, during the day, our S3 TPS can go between 800 to 1600. So this was the initial solution we had. Again, this is a simple view of the solution. We're not looking at all the foundational components we had in place. But in its simplest form, we had our lenders interacting with APIs, and these APIs talk to our cloud components. Our cloud components, thanks to the great work done by engineering teams, were deployed on a standardized stack. We used Elastic Beanstalk. 
for capacity provisioning, auto scaling, load balancing. We use S3 for our storage of objects and Postgres for storing our markers. So this was our initial view of the architecture or the solution. We decided to run a workload against it. Again, remember our goal is to get 99% of our transactions in less than 300 milliseconds, have zero downtime, you know, designed for zero downtime. So with that in mind, we ran a workload. What were our observations? Not so good. Right? We were looking at periodic spikes, right, as much as one second. Uh, at its peak, when the TPS was very high, uh, the spikes used to uh, show up even more. And these are object sizes less than 100 KB. So we started on the journey of optimizations. Right? Um, so what are the first key steps? We decided to apply all the best practices that Harsha just alluded to. Entropy. No longer a concern for our workload. So we've pushed S3. We've constantly worked with the S3 product team. And, that, and they've incorporated, they've been incorporating a lot of our requests. Some are still in the works. RTPS is 800 to 1600. With the recent S3 updates, for gets, you could go up to 5,500. 5, for puts, up to, you know, uh, up to 3,500 for prefix. You know, uh, if, your, if your workload work goes above that, you still need to worry about randomizing your first four characters. One observations by our engineers, um, you can't use UIDs or GOITs uh, because they might be random for an object name but are not sufficiently random for the first four characters. So just watch out for that. The next back, best practice, we parallelize puts and gets. Arsha talked about multi-part uploads uh, or pushing the uh, bottleneck to S3, which can scale better. Our objects, uh, our package contained a set of documents. Each document was, um, you know, we had document sizes which varied. Um, so we wanted to use the compute, uh, parallelize execution. The AWS SDK itself does not give you an easy way to parallelize your puts and gets. But most programming languages nowadays, you know, take care of futures, threads, streams. Um, it's pretty much out of the box, so you have to build it outside. One key thing with parallelization, you get a lot of performance, but also debugging becomes a nightmare. Working with SC, uh, AWS support, they always look for three key elements. Tell me your host ID, tell me your request ID, and tell me your extended request ID. So make sure you log that, multiple ways to get that. One way is obviously you can log it on the response. The other way is um, CloudTrail. Enable CloudTrail logs. It's got, um, um, you know, and you could push it to a different bucket, and it's got all the information for you. Next, we externalize markers. S3 is great for gets and puts. It's been built for gets and puts, but not so much for list operations and range gets. Our use case had scenarios wherein we had to do range gets and list operations. So instead of using S3, we externalized it to a Postgres database, RDS on Postgres. For an object marker for us, um, in S3, an object is considered unique between if it's a bucket name, a prefix, an object ID, an object version ID. We took that object marker and stored it outside in the Postgres database, along with business context, along with object metadata, which we would otherwise have stored in S3. So we didn't have to go to S3 for what it was not really working for us, but rather go to S3 for what it worked. And, and externalize the markers for our use case, so that gave us, uh, uh, you know, RDS Postgres as the vehicle for getting what we needed. The other thing is uh, we used RDS also as a secondary index, so we did all our querying off of RDS. So these were the standard best practices. Here is a small code snippet, something you need to watch out for client configuration timeout, and we'll get to it later. Another thing we had to work around, S3's eventual consistency model. Our application was strongly consistent. S3 was eventually consistent. So S3 is strongly consistent for puts of new objects. So if you write a new object, it makes sure it writes it across all partitions before returning with a success. But if you're doing override puts or deletes, S3 is eventually consistent. S3 is built for performance and throughput and less for consistency. So we had to build that outside. We built it, we needed, our application needed to be strongly consistent. We needed asset properties. So we had to move that again to the RDS Postgres that we built. So we used S3 for what it was good for. As you can see in this diagram, you can get dirty reads. You can uh, list objects that have already been deleted. 
So some few scenarios out here. So with these basic optimizations we did, we ran the workload again. So what were our observations? The frequency has now reduced, but we still see spikes. It still, still does not meet our requirements. So we had to go ahead and additionally optimize and add some more optimization. We were looking for consistent low latency responses. One way to get consistent low latency responses by using an in-memory data store. So we decided to cash in. Adding a new component, we've got to work about, worry about durability, worry about availability, so we have to worry about compensation. We have to worry about who, which system is now the SOR for us. We had a latency-sensitive workload, so caching just made sense for us. AWS gives you two options for caching, Redis and Memcached. We decided to go with Redis, open source database, and uh, we like the data structures it provided us. With Elastic Cache on Redis, you get a managed service that's um, easy to deploy, monitor, integrates with CloudWatch, you get all kinds of metrics. And out of the box, you get automatic failover. You can deploy it in a multi-easy uh, deployment. So caching typically has two patterns, a cache read, um, basically a lazy loading pattern, or a write-through cache. Most folks use both. In our scenario, we decided to use both. We had to adjust our TTLs for that. So essentially, with the cache read, uh, we go first to the cache. We see uh, if the cache, if the objects or the package can, is existing in the, in the cache. If it does not exist in the cache, we then go ahead to S3. If you notice, uh, we again go to S3 in a parallel fashion, get the data, load it up into S3. You have to understand, to use the cache effectively, you do need to understand your, the patterns for data access and also adjust your TTLs. The pro with this approach is that you're only caching what you need. So you're not storing more, you're not paying more. The con is that you've got an initial latency for the first request. We were able to save a ton in terms of the milliseconds that we were trying to save just by using the cache. The other pattern was the write-through cache. We used this as well. So we used cache as a temporary SOR. And then offloaded the writes into S3. Again, we had to build compensation. So if you notice, we have a Lambda function that's responsible for that compensation. To compensate the data from the cache, or um, drain that data from the cache into S3. In the case wherein the cache, uh, we've, we've had um, um, cache issues. So with this, um, we were able to uh, get some more optimizations. So let's get switch gears a little bit and look at uh, security. So with, a, with AWS S3, out of the box, you get a lot of foundational elements for security. You know, security in transit with TLS support, security at rest, great integration with IAM, IAM for access. The focus of this discussion is mostly on security at rest. So our data um, at rest needed to be encrypted. We had two options. Initially, we favored going down the client-side encryption option. Couple of reasons. With data client-side data key caching, a data key is used for multiple objects. So that saves us a trip to KMS, saves around 25 milliseconds. Additionally, you don't have to worry about KMS and any of its brittleness. When we started looking um, at SSE KMS, we realized very soon that most of the rest of the ecosystem around S3 integrates well with SSE KMS. With CSE, the data inside S3 is opaque. So you cannot do things like S3 Select, Athena, EMR. None of those tools work well with uh, CSE. For example, even Amazon Macy. KMS is a tier zero service. The more you looked at it, it's internally within AWS a tier zero service. So all other services depend on, on, a, uh, on, on KMS. So that, uh, you know, that's all for most of our reliability concerns around uh, SSE KMS. Also, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, the KMS uh, limits have now been increased from 1,200 to approximately uh, 12K. So out of the box, you get 10K or 12K. It's a shared API limit across all KMS requests for encryption and decryption. And most AWS customers um, have upped uh, the KMS um, limits that come out of the box for an account to approximately 20 or 30K. 
We did that too as well. Upping a KMS limit takes as little as 15, 15 minutes. So with all the benefits that KMS gave us in terms of IAM in integration, uh, visibility into key activity, integration with Cloud, CloudTrail, uh, we thought KMS was a better fit for us than using CSE. So now that actually introduces uh, additional expense in terms of performance of around 20 to 25 milliseconds. If you have a highly variable workloads, workloads that vary from maybe 7,500 to 3.5 million requests, then maybe going with SSE S3 is a better fit than going for KMS. So we did this, did this optimization, took care of eventual consistency, applied caching, data encryption at rest. Where do you think we got? We are in Vegas. I know you guys have pretty much honed your skills by now. Where do you think we reached? Did we get to 95%, 97%, or 99%? Who thinks it's 95%? Remember, we are trying to get to 99. How many of you think uh, 97? Cool, I've got a few over there. How many of you think we've made it? 99%. Well, oh, that's all. That's a, you guys are all optimists. <laughs> so where we got was 97. And our goal is to get 99. So that's still not good enough for us. Uh, so we had to optimize even more. So these, are, these were our results. As you can see, uh, for 97 percentile of our transactions, our response times were less than 300 milliseconds. For put latencies, we got below 300 milliseconds. Um, but you know, um, we decoupled our rights. So, so we, let's go ahead. So we added some more optimizations to this mix. So our initial simple architecture that you had a look started looking like this. We added some more components. And as you can see, once we get into multi-region, this gets even more interesting. Right? Um, so we had to build compensation, as you remember, for uh, the cache. So one of the things we decided to optimize further was on, uh, was on gets and get retries. With gets, for the spikes, occasionally, especially uh, we used to see latencies as much as uh, one second. So we started tuning the client configuration timeout setting. That's an interesting setting. If you tune that to 99 percentile of your workload, and if you have exponential retries, you typically end up getting closer to where you want to get in terms of performance. So that's a variable that we tuned quite a bit. With that in play, one of our engineers uh, suggested, hey, why don't we try out using uh, larger instances? Right? We were using M4, 4x largest. The suggestion was, how about we try out M4, 10x largest? With 10x large, you get 10 gig of network I.O., so you get more I.O. If IO is a, a network I.O. is a bottleneck, maybe that solves it. So we, we ran a test uh, by changing the instances. And uh, really, we didn't see much difference. So larger instances really did not help us. But with the get retries, we were now a little bit closer. So I won't ask you the question again. But right with the, with, with the, with the changes that we did, with all the optimizations that we did, we now reached our goal of getting to 99 percentile. So this is how, how the response times looks like, both for puts and for gets. As you can observe, uh, we are um, within the threshold that we wanted to get to. So I would be remiss if I leave the stage without calling out um, the wonderful team we worked with, the product owners, uh, the squads, the engineering folks. Um, uh, and uh, it was an awesome experience. So with that, I'll give it to Harsha to talk about multi-region. Thank you, Oliver. Right. It's, it's really amazing how Fannie Mae has, has pushed us to deliver for, for highly critical workloads and where the services were not up to the mark, uh, missing out on the 97 percentage versus 99, uh, the to be architecture. So these are some of the examples that, that uh, are extremely important. Your feedback is very important to us for our product development. It is feedback like that through which we have actually delivered higher throughput and also the, um, the data security component of S3, right? So it's, it's still not done yet. The last segment is essentially now that we discussed everything about uh, getting the performance uh, uh, aligned with respect to expectations, how do we now uh, deploy this into a, I mean, if you take a workload like this and deploy into a multi-region uh, uh, fashion, uh, let's touch on some of those aspects. 
Um, RTO, RPO, extremely important conversations. Um, again, these are all, there are industry mandates, there you could have agency mandates if you're working with, or maybe industry mandates uh, where you may have specific RTO requirements or recovery point objectives and recovery time objectives that you may have to meet. Um, so I'm gonna just touch on some of those uh, key patterns before we conclude. So uh, achieving resiliency, um, I, I, this is extremely important to understand. Please assume things will fail. Uh, you, you, are, you have to assume your app, app and app's components will fail. You have, your dependencies could fail. You could have a network glitch. You, you, maybe your VPN tunnels will go down or DX connection may go down. You, you have to start thinking in terms of building your resiliency and, and, uh, you know, um, uh, into every single component, right? Redundancy and resiliency, both. Uh, availability zones and regions, again, you may have API errors into a specific region for a specific uh, service. So you need to start thinking about how do I do exponential retries. This is very, very important for coders. If you're a developer, if you're encountering a 5x error against an API call, make sure you do that re exponential retries as part of your logic uh, so that you, don't, uh, you have a workaround for that. Um, app dependencies, again, uh, the, some of the very high patterns, uh, that there are essentially three categories in which you need to think about resiliency, right? One is app resiliency, which I just spoke about, uh, defensive, clothing, uh, the defensive coding in terms of uh, retries, uh, cloud native design, and most of you uh, may be familiar with 12-factor uh, app, um, and also uh, have uh, circuit breakers as part of your logic, right? Uh, what are some of the deviations that you observe and how do you take uh, um, you know, corrective measures for that? Um, and get, move away from a monolithic application architecture. Um, I str strongly recommend microservices. Again, stateless applications, we, you heard that. Um, you can always maintain state outside. You can leverage uh, caching or, or even uh, customers have uh, used DynamoDB to maintain cache uh, or, or the state. So do, start building microservices and also stateless application architectures. Um, and operational and network res resiliency is extremely important. Much like many of the customers I've worked with have already built in resiliency in terms of data center design. Maybe you have redundant network uh, switches, uh, HSRP, VRRP technologies on the Cisco side. Uh, I've seen uh, dual NIC cards, dual, dual HPAs. You have already done that, and all you have to do is to extend that functionality and make sure you are taking advantage of multi-AZ architectures on the AWS side. Um, so talking about resiliency within uh, a region, again, uh, most of you may be familiar with multi-AZ. Uh, just to uh, reemphasize, a, a single AZ is not a single data center. Please keep that in mind. A single AZ consists of multiple data centers in a metropolitan area. Um, so you, you have built-in res resiliency if you are leveraging uh, multi-AZ functionality. On the, on the diagram I'm trying to convey there on the right side, the, in pink, if you have components of application that are mostly 99% uh, uh, available, but only a single component that's not giving you or, or ha that has 90% availability, your overall app availability goes down to 90%. You can absolutely increase that by just doing multi-AZ uh, by increasing, essentially leveraging multi-AZ to get you that 99%. So please keep that in mind if you're deploying production workloads, leverage multi-AZ is the key takeaway. And also for, for extremely uh, uh, latency sensitive workloads, have some dark capacity um, as, as needed. Of course you can leverage auto scaling as the, uh, as the need is, uh, but in case you are worried about that, always have some extra dark capacity for for uh, uh, faster responses. Multi-region, again, very important. Uh, a lot of confusion about uh, what is the methodology, when should I leverage this. Um, do you essentially have four options in terms of uh, 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 the uh, multi-region uh, deployment. The first one, which is not here, is um, a, a strictly use that for DR purposes, meaning you already have pushed out your data to region two, your DR site, and all you have to do is, in a DR scenario, have your CloudFormation template fire up your resources, bring up your entire application stack, and start uh, ingesting data and start processing that. But uh, realistically, for enterprises, there are three. Pilot light, active standby, active active. It all depends on contingent upon your business. Again, back to RTO, RPO, that will drive your selection process. What is your sensitivity for RTO, RPO? Uh, that will dictate which model you may want to adopt. Uh, one thing 
uh, again, this is a very common uh, question I get asked is, how do I do, do I have to uh, replicate, how, what, what's the methodology to replicate the data? Is it synchronous, is it asynchronous? It all depends on how you are, um, which services are you using to replicate your data. S3 offers you cross-region replication, CRR. Um, that is, although keep in mind, we do not give you uh, a, a, a RPO guarantee, so you need to bake that into your application design. So you can leverage CRR for replication in a database. You, there are a few technologies that you could use, for example, uh, cross-region read replica. If you're using Aurora or RDS, essentially you can use uh, cross-region read replica. The goal is, again, of course, you, you should monitor the using CloudWatch, the replica lag, and in case you are having an issue on, uh, in your primary region, you promote your read replica to be your master database and then start processing that, right? Um, so that's what is depicted here. Um, and if you want, uh, right now, except for DynamoDB uh, through global tables, there is no synchronous replication across two regions for any of the storage layers, right? So you would have to think about baking that, is, if that's a requirement. If you are talking about, say, I have a banking application, I have a requirement of RPO of uh, zero, uh, I cannot go down, right? Then in that case, you have to start baking into your application design uh, multi-region uh, commits uh, the simultaneously. So the, the, there are complexities around that. By going at, by approaching uh, the design using multi-region uh, writes, the issue is now you are the onus is on you to write to both locations and get a confirmation, get a 500 or, or 200 OK response from both. So there is a lot of engineering effort that goes into multi-regions. So keep that in mind, and also the costs. Keep in mind. The, the, if, if you are doing pilot light on the left, of course it's a, it's a function of cost. You are not really running a hot, hot capacity. Uh, that's obviously uh, much more uh, cost effective. But as you go into more near zero downtime uh, in an active-active scenario, the, your complexity increases and so does your cost. Um, again, uh, from a multi-region options, just to give you a quick uh, overview about the multi-regions options if, from an RPO perspective, if you go all native with AWS, you will have, again, a higher RPO because you would have to rely on asynchronous replication of data set from region one to region two. But if you want to leverage, say, if you're having some on-prem technologies that you want to have, you know, replicate data, so that you could absolutely do that using your custom solution. But again, there is a lot of operational overhead and engineering overhead to do that, right? Uh, so it, it all depends on the data classification. How do you uh, define your, is it a tier one app, or is it a tier four app? Is it mission critical, or is this something that you can live with with a replication lag of a few seconds to a few minutes? So that is something that you, can, you have to decide. Uh, but essentially, uh, sync versus async replication options are, are listed here. If you are uh, highly consistent and you, you want even uh, zero downtime, that, that's something you, that you have to do using custom DB and custom replication strategies, just so we're clear on that. Uh, and um, simple high availability plan, again, we have discussed this uh, between uh, the most common pattern is go send most of your traffic to region one and always send a little bit of a uh, traffic to region two just to make sure your your uh, DR strategy is working. You don't have to do your annual DR testing, right? This way you're actually continuously testing whether the functionality is up and running. The only caveat here is for some traffic that is going to region two, you should expect a little bit of a latency because you're going cross region for the database connection. So that, that's very important. Um, for uncoupled multi-region writes, uh, so again, uh, as discussed, uh, Oliver has discussed, they have already implemented something like this. So you can essentially, that's a, that's a pattern. Um, we have seen that uh, multiple customers uh, deploy that pattern. And again, the goal is, is to set up your cross-region replication with buckets, and you're doing the, uh, the sync, uh, synchronous uh, writes to a cache layer, and asynchronous uh, writing to Amazon S3, and then you're doing CRR for cross-region. And for similarly multi-region uh, reads, uh, again, you could do that, similar uh, pattern, using cache for reads, and if, if there is a cache miss, you go to uh, S3 to fetch your data. Um, same thing with, uh, again, you can do, use your uh, cross-region replication for the data across the other uh, region. 
The, the whole idea here is, it depending, it depending upon your RTRP requirements, you may want to tweak this design, these patterns, uh, to suit your workload. Key takeaways. Uh, quickly, if, if, if S3 supports thousands of TPS. It's, it's possible to scale that. And we spoke about uh, uh, prefix manipulation to do that. Parallelizing gets and puts is extremely important. Please have retries. I, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to bake that into your process. Make sure if you ever uh, encounter anything like a 500 or 5XX, uh, have a retry mechanism. Last 1%, meaning 99% of your throughput requirements can be met with the design patterns that we have already discussed that 1% takes significant effort. So there are many ways to do this. So as long as it's a regional uh, solution that you're developing, these patterns most likely will work. If it's a cross-region pattern, you would have to think about how, how you're baking in your compensation, how are you writing to two different regions and doing commits or synchronous replication and things like that. So keep that in mind. SSE KMS is good for most use cases that I have seen, right? AES-256 encryption. Uh, it makes a lot of InfoSec people happy because that, that gives them uh, the confidence that the, the data is secured, be it uh, PII data or, or your business uh, intelligence data, right? And there is a very low uh, KMS overhead. Uh, with respect to um, objects and metadata, again, keep in mind, if you are doing a list operations on billions of objects, of course, there will be latency. So you need to have a meta store, metadata associated with that object stored somewhere else. And that's exactly what Oliver was talking about in terms of uh, having markers database in a, in a Postgres database or, or RDS database. So keep that in mind. You may want to, as, your, as you scale your uh, operations on S3, make sure you have a metadata stored somewhere. I'm not saying RDS is the only way to do it. You could do DynamoDB. We have seen a lot of customers do that. So make sure you do that. Cash in for predictable low latency. Again, if you cannot, if you have to compensate for latency or latency spikes, you can always uh, cash in. Yeah, some of uh, you may be familiar with uh, DynamoDB. They have launched uh, an offering called DAX, DynamoDB Accelerator. The idea is having a cache layer in front of DynamoDB. Pretty much that's something you may want to replicate on S3 side, have cached in uh, for uh, low latency requests. Keep in mind, if you are shooting for four nines of availability for your application, if that's what your, your, your engineering goal is, then make sure you do a read and write from both regions, I mean, to, to region architecture, um, and you have to think about how are you going to replicate the data, how consistent the data has to be, can you tolerate a little bit of uh, um, um, latency from one uh, region to another, uh, if you can tolerate that, and how can you know what is the latency uh, using CloudWatch? Please use that and measure that. And um, as also something that um, Oliver has mentioned, going bigger instances is not necessarily the, the better option always, right? That there, you have to measure the throughput and see uh, whether you want to scale horizontally to get your performance characteristics. And again, be a little unconventional. S3 is, uh, uh, is, uh, is an amazing service. You can certainly continue to improve on the performance. And for 99% uh, of the transactions, what we have observed for specific workload is under 300 milliseconds requirement, that's the target, right? 99% uh, under 300 milliseconds, uh, and it, with added benefits of better availability, better TCO. So that's, that's extremely important takeaway with reducing TCO costs. Thank you.